Hello, welcome to my channel, Learning C Sharp Fundamentals from Scratch. I am Alex Horton. Today, we are not going to be talking about C Sharp. I wanted to touch on something that happened this past week. This is the week of uh, Christmas, this coming week. Today's the 22nd. Uh, but last week, about Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I want to say, uh, something historical happened <clears throat> on the uh, on Wednesday of this past week, I believe, um, the 45th president of the United States was impeached by the House of Representatives. And now I am not going to go into the political details of that, but I'm going to tell you about something that happened, a story that kind of came up in, um, it was kind of, I don't want to say piling on, but I would, I would imagine that it didn't, it didn't help things, uh, either and so what am i talking about well last week there was a story that came about about the united states government listing wakanda as an official free trade partner the united states department of Ag agriculture has an application that they have out there that they host and it is supposed to uh, track free trade agreement partners and it tells uh, those individuals that use that particular tool how much they would have to spend or they would have to expect to be paid for items that they're going to trade with free trade agreement countries and so I am I'm not a professional on when it, you know as it comes to um, tariff and free trade and stuff like that. That's not my judge, but <clears throat> I am a long time software engineer and developer. And so when I heard about this story, I thought it was a really great example to talk about what we're going to talk about today. And so if we look through the particular story a little bit here, it shows that, um, it said President Donald Trump may be preparing to slap tariffs on Wakanda, the fictional homeland of the Marvel superhero. Um, and people are just kind of clowning now. The, the person who spotted this, this situation, if you go to this guy's Twitter, he says, Wakanda is listed as a free trade partner on the USDA website. Huh? And if you click on the actual picture, you can see down here that Wakanda is indeed listed there. And not only that, he had some other pictures out there too, where he was grabbing data actually that came back for Wakanda as a free trade partner. Swine, goats, sheep, chickens, turkeys, geese, and all that kind of stuff. Obviously there was, you know, I don't understand why there wasn't any, you know, vibranium listed, but anyway. So what happened here? Why did this happen? Well, as we continue to look through this, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, something that's going to be kind of a boring topic today, but it's something that you really need to know if you're getting into software engineering and development. It's something that will protect you. It will protect the company that you may work for, or if you own your own business and you're doing this yourself, it'll protect your company as well. And what is that I'm going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the software development life cycle. So today's purpose of our video is we're going to find out what the heck SDLC is. We're going to understand and find out why it's so important. What is a methodology? So there's going to be some terms I'm going to throw around here that, like I said, it's going to be a little, a little boring. We're not going to do any coding in this particular video. Um, but this is something that we need to know about. We have to understand how this works because if you go to a company and you're working on behalf of that company, you have to follow an SDLC process. And what could happen if you don't have an actual SDLC process in place? So first, let's talk about what SDLC is. SDL, SDLC stands for the Software Development Lifecycle. And it's at least six different steps on how to create an actual development cycle and a product. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm trying not to say, okay, a whole lot here. <laughs> so, 
So what is the SDLC used for? Well, it's an organized way to manage phases of a software engineering project. And you can actually use this for things other than software engineering, um, for other projects. If you're gonna plan a project out, it's great to organize it. You should try it out sometime. Just try organizing something like going to the grocery store, right? You know, you make a list, you, you do those things, you plan out what you're gonna do, you analyze what you need, you design a shopping list, you know, and, and go from there. I said, you know, again here. <laughs> Another thing that the SDLC does is it guides a project from idea, from an idea to a reality. You cannot get from A to Z without doing the steps B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on and so forth without a plan. Another thing that the SDLC does is it helps by organizing duties and responsibilities. So when you collaborate and you're working together as a team, you'll need to be able to organize duties and responsibilities on that team. Everybody cannot work on the same thing at the same time. So you need to organize by uh, getting a plan together and delegating duties and responsibilities to different individuals. Another thing that the SDLC does for you, it gives you opportunities to plan for issues, shortcomings, and unforeseen problems properly. So things will always come up in a development phase. Um, a database could go down. Uh, you could lose connectivity between yourself and the client. You know, I, I said it again. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that can happen. I mean, heck, I used to work on a team where I myself had an accident um, and needed surgery. One of my coworkers, she had an unforeseen issue and she was out for an extended period of time with medical issues. And my boss, she turned around and she had some issues that year too while I was gone. But the business had to keep going on. Those are things that are unforeseen. Life just happens, situations just come up. But if you have a proper plan in place, anybody can implement the plan and, and that and that work can still be done. But the, one of the most important things that an SDLC process does for you is it saves you money. Yeah, if you have a plan, you can reduce unnecessary expense. You can also reduce unnecessary time wasting. Um, you can also get rid of waste, okay? Ugh, okay. <laughs> so what are some of the steps of the SDLC process? Well, some of the basic steps of an SDLC process are to identify the problem or the request. That's the very first thing that you do. You have to identify, is there a problem that we need a solution for? It could be that there's something already in place for the situation. Never can tell, but that's where the analysis phase comes into play. If there is a problem and a request needs to be made, then you have to plan together with the customer or the client to make an understandable plan by them and you to address the problem. Who does this? Well, usually a project owner or a project leader or somebody like that would be the go-between between, between yourself as a developer and the client slash, you know, client services folks. The next thing that you're gonna do is you're going to, once you've got a plan together, you know that there's a problem, you know that you're gonna have to design software to solve the issue, you're going to come up or your team is going to come up with a design document that is going to help you. It's gonna put in paper exactly what you need to do um, not, you know, not step by step as far as like this, this piece of code goes here, this piece, it's not a design, it's not a code design document. It is a process document and a plan that you put together as a developer that only you can do. That's why they pay you the developer. And since you're the developer, you're the expert matter, you're the SME, you're the subject matter expert on what you do as a developer. So you're going to come up with the technical design on how to solve that problem. That uh, That's going to include a time and cost estimate. How long is it gonna take you to 
uh, uh, code and to test and to get everything back over there to them. How long is it going to take to implement, take to implement the process? So that is what the design phase is, is for. And in that design phase, hopefully a lot of the things in the first two phases have been worked out. Again, there's a lot of, in these first three phases, these are all planning phases. Once you get all the planning out of the way, then you would actually do the physical build of the solution to your problem. This is where you're going to sit down or you're, you're going to have a team of developers sit down and actually write code and test code and do all that kind of stuff. Next, you're going to test your solution. You're going to have unit test your solution, build test cases for your solution. Um, you're going to do uh, quality assurance testing. That means you're going to give it to another set of eyes to look over your solution to make sure that your solution lines up with what the design document says that you're supposed to be doing. And then there's also unit uh, user acceptance testing or what we call UAT. That's where it would go back to the client or the customer for them to get their hands on it and to see, okay, this is exactly what we want. This is perfect. Or can we make this change or can we do this or can we do that? You don't want, you, you won't want to get into a situation where you're giving that solution back to the customer and they're demanding changes that weren't in the design phase. So, the other thing that that does is if you have these first three nailed out is you can eliminate something that I'm going to talk about later, uh, scope creep. Once all your testing is done, you're going to deploy your solution. That means you're going to have a plan for deployment. You're going to have a rollback plan for deployment. If something goes wrong, maybe, um, this is the instance and where somebody else is going to deploy your code for you, um, because of. Uh, something that I'm going to talk about later in this particular video, you're not going to deploy your own solution. Somebody else would have deployed the solution for you. There has to be a separation of duties there. That's just good business practice and it's the law. Um, <clears throat> and then you'll also have other things that you might decide. So for example, are you going to have what's called a bridge going on a conference bridge where you have a bunch of people on the phone as the, the, the solution is deployed and put out in a production environment, is everybody going to be on the bridge to hear what's going on um, and to address problems that may arise that day? Um, is there going to be a rollback procedure? If something goes horribly wrong, are we going to roll this back, take people off the telephones or roll back the code so that we can start doing, you know, the stuff that we were doing before? You don't want to have broken code out there. So you always have a plan in place for things go wrong. If your deployment works just fine, you go through a phase <clears throat> where you're validating your deployment results. And once that's done, you're now in what's called a maintenance phase where you're going to just maintain the solution. Now, every piece, every, every change that you make to this particular solution is no longer a new development. It's an enhancement to that particular development product. So for example, Microsoft Windows, when they first came out with Windows 10, they had, let's say, version 1.0.0.0. That was the first version of Windows. And as they, as they continue to go through their process of updating and enhancing Windows, they push out new changes here and there. The next thing we have to understand is there's different ways to look at doing software development lifecycle methodology or let me rephrase that. There's different ways to go about implementing software development in your life cycle. It's called a methodology. What does that mean? A methodology is basically just a style of software development life cycle that you're going to use to help you develop your project. It's just the way that you're going to organize it. I had a professor once who told me as I was going through my, um, going through college, he said to me, he said, you know, <clears throat> there's this restaurant across the street and we might all get across the street and we won't cross the street the same way, but we'll all get across the street. Nonetheless, all that, an, all that an 
SDLC methodology does is it allows you to develop the project in the most organized way that you that is comfortable for everyone as a business. So most organizations that are in business that have any kind of an IT department or anything like that have an already established SDLC process in place of some sort. It may not be the best one for them. Um, it may not work for them and it may be something that they need to come up with differently, but they mostly have some sort of a process put into place. There's several different methodologies that you can choose from. There's a waterfall method. There's agile. There's iterative. DevOps, V-shaped, and Lean. And I'm not going to go into all six of those. I'm just going to talk about a, a couple of them because quite frankly, I've not used all of them. Uh, I've used three out of the six that you see there. And so those are the ones that I will talk about a little bit more. Um, I actually, I think I've used four of them now that I think about it. Um, but they're just different ways to accomplish your goal. Now, let's look first at the waterfall method. The waterfall method is probably the most well-known and the easiest to implement of all of the different SDLC methodologies. It's the oldest. It's been around for a very long time. It's tried, tested, and true. It is, um, so it's real easy to learn. It's just what I like to call a uh, paint by numbers development phase. So as you see the boxes here, what would happen is you get your set of requirements, you do your design document based on your requirements that you have in hand at that time, you would implement your, your uh, development, meaning that you would actually build your, your software, you'd verify the results and do your, um, your deployment and then you'd be in your maintenance phase. So if you go through this, it's very easy to understand. Like I said, it is paint by numbers development, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. You can't, you can't do, you, uh, you can't do step five and not do steps one, two, three, four. It's really easy to, to prioritize the work when it's this way, because based on the requirements you have, you know what you're going to be building right away. The fallback of that, however, <clears throat> is that it has high risk and uncertainty. What if the requirements are incomplete when they're given to you? Any developer who has been a developer for any period of time will agree with what I'm about to say. I have never done a piece of development work at all that where I got 100% complete requirements. Something always changes. It doesn't matter what methodology you use. It will always change. So with that, the waterfall method is not conducive to high risk and uncertainty. If you are given requirements and you're in your phase of implementation and you're actually building software and somebody comes back to you a week later and says, hey, this has changed, you gotta start the whole process all over again because your design document's gonna change, your requirements are gonna change. And then it's a knife fight because when you're working with larger clients who feel entitled, what happens is they feel like they can change anything at any period of time. And if you're using a waterfall method, you're not going to allow that change. So it's not for a complex project and the product is only ready after all the steps are over. So if you have very complex requirements, you're going to, you're going to have a really long build time. And that's not really something that, um, a lot of companies that are paying for a return of investment and they budget money for their projects throughout the year, they're not going to like that kind of a, of a method. The next method, that you learn uh, that we're going to talk about is agile and agile <clears throat> the agile method is divided into short iterations called sprints so for example and and usually sprints are a couple of weeks two to four weeks in you know in length where you're going to get a group of 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 projects and tasks to work on in that particular sprint 
you're going to do this iteration where you're going to plan it out. You're going to design the stuff. You're going to test it, build it and go through user acceptance testing. And once that's all done, you're going to deploy it. But then you come back to the same version of that solution and you're going to build upon that solution and you're going to enhance that solution and make an enhancement to that solution. So then that would be iterated to two. So for example, if we said we're going to build widget A, and let's say widget A is just going to pour, uh, is going to put out a cup on the table. Then iteration one, what it would do is it, we, by the, by the time we got done with iteration one, we would have a piece of software that would be able to put a cup on the table. Iteration two is going to take that same solution and build upon it. And it's going to take that cup and pour something into the cup. That would be iteration two. Iteration three is that same solution, but instead of just taking the cup, putting it on the table and pouring liquid into it, now we're going to put something else into the liquid. Like let's say it's hot chocolate. So iteration one is to take the cup, put it on the table. Iteration two is to pour the hot water. Iteration three is to pour the hot chocolate and the marshmallows in there and deploy that. That is the same piece of software, but each iteration you're building upon the previous iteration. So <clears throat> you have a lot more minimized risk due to a flexible change process. Um, you can release code very fast because this first version of the code is just a very bare bones basic. We're going to get this code out the door. It's going to work. It's going to do X, Y, Z knowing that the final uh, version of what you are looking at is going to come in like iteration three. Some of the drawbacks of that, however, is your team has to be very highly professional and client first because things are going to change. And I'm here to tell you developers don't like a lot of change. They want to do their work. They want to do what they're going to do. They love to collaborate, but they want to get to what they want to get to because they want to move on to the next thing and learn something new. <clears throat> new requirements may conflict with existing code. So let's go back to the hot chocolate um, scenario that we we're talking about. Let's say in iteration one, we're going to put the cup on the table. And as we're building iteration two, somebody comes back in iteration ones and said, and, and somebody comes back with iteration two, and instead of putting this on a table, they're going to put this in a car. Well, that changes the existing code base. So now you've got a problem because now your scope of your other two iterations have changed and now it's just a domino effect. So new requirements can conflict with existing code. Also, the project can exceed the expected time with all the changes that are allowed. Because now, let's go back. If I go back here and I change this to be a car instead of a table, now I've got to go back and redo these other two iterations. And I'm not even, I haven't even got to the third iteration because I'm making changes to the first two iterations. So that's the some of the drawbacks of the agile method of methodology of SDLC. Um, I am more well versed in the um, waterfall, but I'm experienced in agile too. And 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 to quit to be quite honest with you, I do like the agile method. Uh, you know, the more I got to, to know it. The last one I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is the V-shape method. And the V-shape method is basically an expanded waterfall model, but it's more strict. So you have your planning, all of your planning there, and you go straight to coding and all of your unit testing, integration testing, system testing, acceptance testing. And then also what's going to happen is, so it's going to come this way, requirements, specifications, you got a high level design, you have a lower level design. And in your coding, this is where your planning is going to come into play. So testing and verification are very early stages in your, in your V-shaped model. There, it's, it's, it can be better for smaller projects with very static requirements that don't change. Something that you can do over and over and over and over again. When I first started being, when I first got into development work, what would happen is I, at, a, at the company I used to work at, my first company I used to work at, what happened was we would get, um, we would get a packet of our tasks 
our boss will come by and throw that packet on our on our desk and we know exactly how long it was going to take us and so we kind of use this kind of a method when i go back and i think about it now the drawback of that is it's not flexible you have to stick to the requirements that are there otherwise you can delay production of your finished project. Um, it's a bigger risk because if you miss any of these steps or you mess up any of the, all of these steps have to be done for you to get over here to the last phase. And it's not really good for projects where, for projects where the requirements can change that aren't static, that, that are more uh, fluid. And so because of that, the V-shaped method is not one that you would want to use uh, if, if you're going to try to be flexible with a customer. Now, what could happen if you don't have an SDLC process? Well, there are a few things can happen. The first thing that happens is you're going to create an improper solution. Um, <clears throat> if you're, if you don't have the right process in place and you've not done the proper planning, you haven't done the proper sizing, uh, you might put some work out there or put a piece of product out there. Um, that um, may not work for you and it may not work for a client. And so because of that, you want to go through the SDLC process. A great example of this um, is the video game industry. Um, there's a couple of games that were, were um, there's a couple of games that were developed this past year and the year before last, I want to say. And if you go and you look at those particular pieces of software, it, it, <clears throat> it didn't go so hot. Actually, I, it, it, they call it AAA gaming, right? And so I use right again. It's been a while. Uh, AAA games. If you, if you Google like EA's Anthem or Fallout 76, or Alien Colonial Marines, or WWE 2K20, those games have had major issues after they were released. In fact, Anthem, which was released on the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, if I'm not mistaken, there were reports of Anthem uh, causing PlayStation 4 to stop working. Now, if you're a person and you've got a PlayStation 4 and you've got a video game where um, it's made your, it's made your system stop working, you're not going to be too happy about that. And so it, it got some really, really bad um, reviews uh, from people um, and, it, and EA stock took a hit. Uh, it's, I'm reading this. It says that the Anthem release comes on the back of a rocky February for EA stock. It was sent plummeting to an intra month low of $80 and 21 cents per share after the company said it did not perform to expectations in its third quarter. So <clears throat> the issue that you have here is if you don't go through the proper planning process, here's the, here's the link right here. It talks about how EA uh, had an issue. And if you don't know, EA is the same company that makes Madden and all those kind of things. And they had to, they had to walk back some things. They said, you know, we, we screwed up, we messed up, you know, and that's something that you never want to tell people after they've dropped 60, 65 or 59 99 on a game. You don't want to tell people, Hey, we messed up. You're going to have a lot of ticked off people at you. So <clears throat> what happened is, is that they had an improper solution because they may or may not have followed the SDLC process and it cost their company money. The next thing you have to look at is lost capital revenue or income. Again, if you look at Anthem, if you look at Fallout 76, um, these are these are games and I, I'm just concentrating on games right now. I'm not even gonna concentrate on, um, I'm not even gonna uh, concentrate on on things that, uh, for like bigger businesses. Right. And I said, right again, I'm, I'm down to like two rights here. <laughs> so lost capital revenue or income. So what happens is if you don't follow SELC, then people are going to not buy 
the stuff. You're not, they're not going to buy your product. And if that's a problem, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's obviously a problem because you've got all this work into this particular product. Here's Fallout 76. Users scored it at 2.8. The critics scored it at a 53 out of 100, out of 100. It's not good. I mean, people are really ticked off at this game. Because again, they, you have developers that are released and companies that are releasing buggy software and hardware, uh, buggy software, I'll say just software. And people are not going to buy those products because word of mouth, you know, it, it gets around. The next thing you have is a disorganized work effort. So if the SDLC process is not um, followed, then the problem that you're going to have is you're going to have an or unorganized work effort. And so one of, one of the things that I'm trying to type here at the same time and talk, one of the things that you had here um, uh, for this particular product, Aliens Colonial, Colonial Marines, was that and, and actually this one was, there was a lawsuit about this one. People were claiming a bait and switch had happened um, because you had Gearbox Software's CEO, um, was uh, Randy Pitchford, he was going out and telling people that they're gonna be this. They had this big demo at one of the E3 shows where you know you buy video games and stuff like that and display new video games. And when the, when the product was released, it was nowhere near what people saw in the demo earlier on a year or two later. And this was a game that had, it, it often makes the worst list of games list. And so actually people were suing to get their money back on this game because it was, uh, people talked about how the AI is broken and not all challenging. And, and so it, it, it what it did was it ticked a lot of people off. They're dropping $50 on something that doesn't work. Well, the reason why that happened here on Gearbox and, and Alien Colonial Marines is because Sega had employed one development team who may have used a different methodology for their software development lifecycle and Gearbox did something else. Let's say one used Agile and the other one used uh, Waterfall. Well, you had an unorganized work effort and when the product was released, it had taken a huge hit in quality. So you have that. Another thing that can happen is what's called scope creep. If you are trying to build widget one, two, three, and as you get through your process, if you don't have a good process in place, people are going to start to put, try to put change into the process. And when you are trying to develop a product under a tight timeline, you cannot have a ton of change to that process. Now you can build in some scope creep into your process, but not major stuff. And so what happens is then you get delays and delays and delays and delays in software getting out the door. Um, that was one of the things that happened with a product called Duke Nukem. Uh, forever, I think it was another Gearbox uh, software solution. It had been under development for a very long time, like almost a decade, I want to say, maybe a little more than that. And what happened was the, the scope of the product kept on changing for some odd reason. And it delayed the release of this title for a long time. And when it came out, it was just a half done effort. And a lot of people were ticked off at it. Lack of proper resources to create a solution. If you don't have a process in place, part of the planning process is what do I need to get the job done? That's one of the things you'll discuss. How many developers do I need? Do I need five developers? Do I need 10, a team of 10 developers? Who do I need to help me solve this problem? If you don't go through the SCLC process, you'll never get an answer to that. And you won't have enough people to do the job or maybe you won't have the right equipment to do the job. And let's say you need Visual Studio and they give you uh, NetBeans instead. 
or they give you Python instead, or they give you a PHP editor instead. That's not, you're not gonna be able to do your job. So the SDLC, process, the SDLC process also makes sure that you've got what you need to do the job. There won't be any confidence in the process created. And, and trust me, people can tell if you produce a piece of software and you don't follow a plan. Customers can tell, people can tell, and a lot of people will understand that and they'll see right through it. Not only that, they won't have any confidence in anything else that you deliver to them. That's a problem if you're trying to build confidence in your company for the things that you do, if that's one of your specialties as an IT firm. So without a valid process in place, you will not be able to build confidence in the industry, in the work that you do. Finally, if you don't have an SDLC process, <clears throat> quite frankly, it can cost you legally a lot of money. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, something uh, called governance, risk and compliance in reference to this legal ramifications thing. Now, this is again, this is a longer video because we're talking about SDLC and we're going to follow this up with the reason why I brought up the Wakanda thing we're going to look at that and see what broke down in the SDLC process. <clears throat> but what are some of the possible legal ramifications if you don't have a software development lifecycle process? Well, if you don't have a, in large companies or in any company, most companies, you have something called governance, risk, and compliance. I am by no way, shape, or form a GRC expert. I know a couple of them, three, of, three, three or four of them at least, uh, that I used to work with. They're really smart people. <laughs> and if I have a question, those are the folks I ask about it. But governance, risk, and compliance, if you, if you boil it down, it's just some common sense things, okay? Governance is how you're going to govern the processes and procedures that, uh, you're gonna come up with processes and procedure that govern your business. That's the governance aspect of it, right? Uh, policies, procedures, plans, documents, SOPs, whatever you call it. They're going to help your business function because you're gonna have things in place. They're gonna tell people what they have to do, when they have to do it, and, how, and what rules they have to follow. Risk, I'll talk, I'll talk about risk last. Compliance is enforcing the rules that you have in place, not just your rules, but rules that may be passed down from the state governments and the federal government as well. Because no matter what you say or do, if you're not, or you be a nonprofit organization or a for-profit organization, you got to follow what Uncle Sam wants you to do. And then finally, risk. Risk is something that, um, is it there's human risk there's technical risk these are things that put your company at risk and your job as a grc person is to identify those risks mitigate those risks and reduce those risks that what and what that does is it put your it puts your company in a much better spot because you can reduce issues before they happen so why did i bring all that up because there's like I said earlier, legal ramifications, there's a law that people have to follow. It's called the Sarbanes-Oxley Oxley Act and it's SOX for short. It was implemented for every business, uh, publicly traded businesses, I should say that, definitely, but all businesses have to follow SOX in some way, shape or form. On July 30th, 2002 by the Congress, the legislation was designed to impose regulation on a company's internal processes when dealing with financial reporting. Failure to comply with this regulation can, meet, can lead to means of dollars and fines and, and even lead to criminal convictions. Okay, that's a whole mouthful. What does that mean? Well, you ever heard of a company called Enron? A guy named Bertie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was cooking the books and he was taking money from a whole bunch of people. And what he would do is he'd take this, this is just in a nutshell, 
what he would do is he would tell people, hey, you give me $100,000 and I'll invest that money for you and make you really rich. And so these people would give him the $100,000 and he would turn around, take that $100,000 and spend it on stuff that he wanted to spend it on and was not investing the money. But then what he did was when people were getting their statements of how their investments were doing, he was faking the statements. He was he was cooking the books, so to say. So every company that's out there has to comply with SOX Act, with the SOX law, and it spans across many departments and affects many internal accounting and management functions, and it has a very major impact on IT operations. I am going to be fully transparent here. I personally um, messed up at a previous place of employment that I worked at, and it could have cost that company a lot of money because I published some software that I shouldn't have uh, in a form that I shouldn't have, I should say, in, in, an, in an area that it really didn't need to be. I created risk for that company. And to mitigate that risk, they had to close that loophole and then they had to close my employment, <laughs> which is what they did, unfortunately. And I really liked working there. But regardless of that, that's what happened. I messed up and it wasn't anything, uh, it wasn't anything that was, um, uh, I didn't do it uh, to be, cause I was angry. Um, I, I didn't do it cause I was in com I had the right idea about it, but I took the wrong, uh, steps. I didn't follow their governance that the company had in place that oversaw that. And because of that, it cost me dearly. However, um, that company, after I left, they had to, they had to mitigate and they had to do some things to protect themselves against somebody coming in behind me and taking advantage of the issue that I may have created. And because they are, they were, they are a publicly traded company. They had to report that to their shareholders and their stockholders. So my one little issue created risk in that large, large company that could have cost people a lot of money. That is why SDLC has to be followed. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act, like I said, was created because of Enron and WorldCom, fraud and inflation of fraud and things of that nature. And these legal cases had disastrous consequences on the global economy as Enron and over a thousand other publicly traded companies had to restate their financial records and the stock market lost $6 trillion almost overnight. So because of this, and it, and it, and what it did was it, 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 um, it contributed to the recession in the early 2000s. It contributed to the recession in the early 2000s. It was not a good time. It was not a good time. And we still, as a country, are still recovering from this issue. So because of all of that, Congress passed the SOX laws in 2002. Now, I said a whole lot today about governance, risk and compliance. I've got some links that I'll put in the video. I said a whole lot today about SOX and uh, SDLC and stuff like that. But let's look here back at what we were talking about just a second ago about the United States government. And let's determine what may have happened here. My own personal experience with this um, is that a couple of different things happen. If you go to the actual website where um, this tool is located, and I did have it here. Let's pull it up here. It's called the Tariff Tracker. USDA, there it is right there. I've got it here. So this is it. Let me zoom in here so you can see. This is it. And so all that happened was, was that this particular drop down had Wakanda at the bottom, as we saw in the screenshot up here. Now, what effect could that, that fraudulent or that, you know, having that data in there. Now, <clears throat> the government uh, entity that hosts this particular tracker, the USDA, 
they came down and they said, hey, uh, we had a guy, a person who was going through there and they were using test files to make sure that the system was running properly. They took the information down. However, NBC News had said that they saw it in there from June 10th, which was in the summer. So almost seven and a half, eight months, it's been in there like that. And nobody said anything about it until this particular week. Political hit job, yeah, probably. But again, it makes them look incompetent. The other part of this is, and when you go into SLC, why is test data in a production environment? That should never happen. What? Here's something that I've seen quite often. I've seen this a lot. If you're a client or you're a person that uses this particular website and you're not paying any attention, you go down to Peru or you go to a group here and what happens is you start looking into this particular commodity and that kind of, that kind of stuff, right? Well, if what happens if you pick the wrong one and you're not paying attention? It happens. Those kind of things happen. What if the Wakanda data was substituted for another country's data? And so on and so forth. That's bad. That's something that is 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 some that's something that's really major. If you have data that gets transposed, instead of paying 12% for eggs in a shell, let's say if you pick the wrong thing, you, you you're paying 25, 30% on a tariff. If you're exporting or importing goods, that's that could be millions of dollars there. So it's important to follow the SCLC process. The mistake that happened with the Wakanda data being in that system over here should never have happened. That's what I'm trying to get to here in today's video. It never should have happened. And I'm not saying that because it's the Trump administration. Hey, I'm no fan of the guy, but again, this is not a political video. This is strictly about People not following the proper procedures that they may or may not have in place over here um, to deploy a piece, a, a, a software solution. That's what happened here. They did not follow established processes and procedures and that data got out the door and it makes them look really, really bad because this, this story blew up like almost overnight and you know, you would think it's not a big thing. And, and, and a lot of these companies that are reporting on this, they're, you know, they're throwing a little shade at it, at, at what happened. The heart-shaped herb didn't make the cut. And I saw one that said, hey, they're not trying to trade in vibranium. You know, I, there's a lot of stuff there that happened that should never have happened because the processes were not followed. It's plain and simple. The processes were not followed. That is why the, the software development life cycle is so important. You have to follow the development life cycle. I would encourage you to go out, read up on what happened with the Enron company, um, read up with what happened with this Wakanda uh, free trade thing, read up on um, WorldCom, and look at a little bit of governance risk and compliance as well. And here's the other, here's the last thing I'm gonna say about that and then we'll end this video. If you're dealing with governance risk and compliance and you do in your software engineer or your software developer or your developer by, of any stretch of the imagination, it is great to know how to code. It is a skill and a, and a skill set that I wish more people would learn. I do. But if you're going to work for another company, you've got to know the proper procedures and the steps to make something come off of an idea of somebody's head to an actual piece of software that they can use and benefit from. If you're not aware of the SCLC process and project management and stuff like that, I would strongly encourage you. And that's something that you don't even need a piece of, uh, you don't need a, a computer for. Study up on the software development life cycle. Study up on that and learn how it works 
what it means and what it's for. Because in the, I'm going to tell you what happened here. After they found out this happened, they started to ask some questions. And I'm not talking about the developers ask questions or their bosses ask questions. I'm talking about um, the president, chief of staff, those kind of folks. They started asking questions because this is bad press. It's bad press and it's a bad look for the government to have an issue like this. So one of the questions they'd ask is who did this work? How did they test it? How did they get out the door like this? Can we validate the other data is correct? The remediation on this could be ugly and somebody could lose a job over this. It's just a bad look. Anything that gets out of the door like this, it's going to be a bad look. And somebody's probably going to, uh, uh, somebody's head's going to roll on this one. So check out SDLC process, check out this. I'll put the links in the video description. Um, as always, if you have any questions, paste them into the video. And as always, God bless you and I hope this serves you well.